declare you are good. And we get to search out your goodness in every circumstance. Thank you, Father. While we were singing, I was thinking two, two specific times the Holy Spirit was bringing back to my mind where he was so faithful. The first, and both of these happened really close to the same time, but was in Haiti. And we were about to come back to the States for our first trip home. And a couple of days before the flight, I came down with just this massive fever. And uh, turned out to be malaria. And it, was, it would spike so high that I would, I would hallucinate, literally hallucinate and see things. And I remember talking to Andrea and it's like, it was such a battle going on. I'm like, I see this, but yet I know it's not real, but I see this. And it was just this ongoing battle. And they were debating whether to cancel my flight, to go, to not go. And I would literally, I'd lay down on the tile floor because it was the coolest thing I could feel, just lay on the tile floor. And the night before my flight, it was about five o'clock in the morning, I literally, I just sat straight up in the bed and I'm like, I am so hungry. And it was completely gone, completely gone. <coughs> Andrea went downstairs to get the kids to pray in the children's home and Abraham had stopped her. This was right before my healing and had stopped her and said, no, 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 I just let them go to bed. They've been up all night praying. And immediately after they go to bed, Andrea comes back up I literally just sat straight up and it was gone. Fever didn't come back. It was just gone. Now, this was days into praying, warring, not accepting. I mean, dealing with the reality of having it, but yet this is not going to uh, stop what God's called us to do. This is not going to shut down my life. And just persevering through that. And when you start thinking God is faithful, that came to my mind really strong. And then there was another time uh, and you can put the giving side up. I'm going to receive an offering and bring Amy up here in just a moment. There was another time shortly after that, that or actually right before that happened, we had had a death in the, the children's home. If you've read our pioneering faith, we go through that in, in detail. Right after we moved the children into the house, two kids were running and they ran over an old well and two of them fell into that and the one that fell first died. And as a result of that, we, we didn't know the systems. We didn't understand Haiti very well at that point. Well, they'd taken one of the children to the, the funeral home. And they came back to us with this just crazy uh, bill that we were obligated to pay. And being new in the country, I mean, a lot of circumstances. Basically, we, we had to pay whatever they said at that point. And was literally facing jail. And we had worked out that we would pay three $500 payments. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot unless you just don't have it. Three $500 payments. And if it wasn't paid on the day, then I would be picked up and taken to jail until it was paid. I knew how to get the money. And legal or not legal wasn't the issue. That was what was going to happen. And I remember the night before that payment was due, we, we gathered and prayed and we didn't have the, the money to pay it. And uh, so we just prayed and said, all right, Lord, I really don't want to go to jail, but if I end up there tomorrow, I've preached there several times, then I'm going to share the gospel daily. I'm going to plant churches in the jail. And, you know, this is just what we're going to do. We were doing those things from the outside, but not from the inside. And I woke up that next morning and we had to walk down to an internet cafe because we didn't have internet. We, it wasn't like in Haiti, you could just check it on your phone at that time. And we walked down to an internet cafe and uh, pulled up our accounts. And that morning, $500 had been deposited into our account. And that, that sounds just awesome, and it is. But how that $500 came about, a friend of someone we knew parent had died and 
the inheritance had cleared, they had given a check and they wanted to tithe off of that check to us in Haiti. And all of that cleared the day before and showed up in our account that morning. So I mean, God is faithful all the way to the end. Now, if it hadn't worked out that way, he would have still been faithful. I really like him to work things out sometimes one way and not the other, but his faithfulness doesn't change. Just because circumstances change or doesn't come about the way we want it or some other unknown circumstances arise, wherever we find ourselves, we have the opportunity to search out the goodness of God. And and here is one of the biggest keys I've learned in life. If you don't search it out, you're probably not gonna find it. I call it hidden glory in dark places. There is glory in every circumstance if you will find it. And you have to be led by the Holy Spirit and allow him, Lord, show me where to find this glory. Show me where you, your goodness will be revealed in this dark, dark place. Whatever the circumstance is, show me where it is. And you're on a pursuit of searching out the goodness of God. And that's when our minds start to shift. We can be going through extremely difficult circumstances. But if we know Him, know His character, know that He is good in all things, then we can search it out. If we don't have that that desire to search it out, if it's not there that's churning inside of us, then even from that place, he's inviting us in to knowing he is good experientially, to know he's good. If we don't think he's good in all circumstances, we don't pursue his goodness. So therefore we're learning more of him. But when we know he's good, it's in those places we get to search it out. And it's such an invitation that so many people miss in their walk with the Lord in confusion, broken relationships, pain, sickness, death, whatever it is, we can find his goodness. We might not find it the first five minutes, the first week. No, we don't wanna hear it sometimes the first year. It's not always immediately there, but it's there. And we don't quit, we're a people of perseverance. Anyway, I want to share that with you. Uh, If you want to give, make checks to the well. Text to give. You can give online. Guys, go ahead and receive the offering. Amy, you can start coming this way. This morning, we get to hear from Amy. Uh, I'm really excited about this message. We're in this series called Unlocking the Box. And we're going to just be, for the, the whole quarter, you're going to hear that term. And for the whole quarter, we are going to unlock things. And and it's intentional, we're praying into it. God, what is it you are wanting to unlock in us this morning? So, Miss Amy, welcome. Thank you, Michael. Um, Just sort of to, because, you know, today is just going to be what today is going to be. Second Chronicle, this is not my message. This is, this is a free, this is an extra. This is a bonus. Second Chronicles 20, verse 22, sorry, 21 and 22. And this is when um, there was a whole bunch of uh, enemies facing uh, the nation. And the King Jehoshaphat had consulted the Lord about how to deal with it. And when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy attire as they went before the army. So let's put the singers before the army and say, give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir who had come against Judah so that they were routed. It is in our praise that we are doing battle. Yes, there's an army behind us, but get the singers out. It is in thanksgiving. It is in God's going to fight our battles, but not if we're not bringing him into the party. And it is through this thanksgiving. And this this word, his steadfast love, that's has said. And we've talked about it before when you spoke. I promise you I won't have two sermons. I'll make this part really short. That's his, that's has said. That is his covenantal love. We are in covenant with God. And we have the right to draw upon him because of that. All right. So that was my mini sermon before the sermon. How many?
many of you know, I mean, know that you know that you know, we have a good father. A good father who gives us gifts. I mean, Jesus, Jesus, you know, if if I'm going to trust anybody, I'm going to trust what Jesus tells me, right? And in Matthew 7, 11, Jesus says, and Mike used this verse last week, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So, I look around and, 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 you know, we all sort of operate with, we'll call it our theological paradigms. And one of the, the paradigms I operate from is, you know, this idea of when we think of fruit of the Spirit, that God has deposited in us seed that through um, walking out our life as Christian, they become the fruit of the Spirit. They become love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, gentleness, patience. That's the one I always stumble over. Kindness, self-control. They become those things. But I also believe that, that while probably maybe not every gift God is ever going to have it, I believe that there's more gifts that get deposited in us when we become Christians than we are fully activating. And that's some of the thinking behind this idea of unlocking the box. It's this, this reality that there are gifts that we have that are from the Father that for some reason we're not fully exploring them. We're not fully operating in them. We're not, they're not fully manifested in our life. So how do we as believers, because God's not going to give us a gift if he doesn't think we need the gift. Right? Okay. So, I heard a yes over here. I'm going to talk over here for a while. <laughs> God, God knows what we need. So he gives us the gifts for us, and, and he gives us the gifts for others. Because sometimes the gift God gives us isn't... The gift God gives me, I'll just make this very personal, because this has been a very personal message for me. Sometimes the gift God gives me, I find out, is for you (laughs) or for somebody else. I want it to be for me, but it's often for others. So we want to help and and understand how do we access the gifts that God has given us. Because if God gave them to us, can you we all agree God wants us to have them. Have you ever given a gift to somebody and say, well, I hope they don't find that gift because I really don't want them to have that gift. Again, if we being evil, (laughs) how much more our good father? So we're going to talk a little bit about um, access and how we get some access. So, you know, last month was Christmas. How many had a Christmas tree with presents under it? Okay, a lot of us. How many of you didn't even have a tree had some presents around the house. Okay. I did too. I had a tree. There were presents under that tree. And better yet, there were presents under that tree that had my name on them. Yeah, that's the best part. They were my gifts. Did I have access to those gifts? No. There was a time. There was a there was, they were in effect locked to me. They were mine. They belonged to me. But because of a timing, there was something that had to happen. Now, so often what we see then is that there is these, you can go to the next slide, there's these, these times where we, we don't have access. The gift is ours, but we don't have access. And we don't have access because sometimes the time isn't right. So, um, I'll be flipping around my Bible a lot today. So if we look in Acts, at the very beginning, uh, sorry, I didn't mark these well. So as Jesus is leaving in Acts 1, he says to the disciples, and while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days away. And the important thing here is 
that Jesus, there is this time where there's this, this kairos moment in God's time. There is this divine time. So we have the gift, but the gift is ready. It's almost like a seed. It is ready to burst forth. It is ready to be released. But God isn't giving us access to the gift before this time. Another reason sometimes you don't have access is, um, did anybody hear Alan's sermon the other day about process? Oh, yeah. We're not ready for it. There's, a, there's this gift, but we're not ready for it. Does anybody give a five-year-old a 1972 Corvette? No, there's a process they need to... First, you, you want them to get old enough to have a driver's license. You want them to learn how to drive. You want to make sure they can be trusted with it. But you, there's this process that needs to happen before the gift gets released. The gift is there, but they don't have the access to it because there's a process. There's also gifts we have, and they are unlocked. We don't realize they're unlocked. So it's, it's, it's like there's this box and the lock is open and we are staring at that box and we are going, Lord, give me a key. And God is thinking, take the lock off, open the box. So we're having this, and that, that's, there's an awareness that there are, there's an availability um, that we don't have yet. And then the third category, which I'm going to probably spend the rest of this message on, is the box is open, we have access, and we know we have access. So if we think about this Christmas analogy a little more, how many of you ever have, you know, your kids, you buy them all these great gifts, and there's like five of them that sit, they're unwrapped, but that's it. They never get played with again. There's toys that are there, but not used. They are gifts that they have, but they're not utilized. And that's a choice. That is a choice about what we are making. So there are gifts God has given us. We know we have them, but for various reasons, we don't use them. So I want to talk about my friend Timothy. I like Timothy because I feel a lot more like Timothy than I feel like Paul. (laughs) So 2 Timothy 1 verses 5 through 7. I am reminded, this is Paul writing to Timothy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first among your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. So Paul, is, Paul knows Timothy's in, in the family. Paul has no doubt that Timothy has this deep faith that Jesus is his Lord. For this reason... Because I know you have this faith. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. There's some interesting things that, that, you know, because when we prepare for a sermon, we always do our little word study. And the first thing that, that actually I noted was that the gift here is actually it's charisma. And that word is closely associated with charismata. So we do not know the gift that Paul is talking about. Timothy knows. Timothy knows what this gift is. The gift he received at the laying on of hands. Timothy was fully present and it was words were spoken of him and hands were laid. So we don't know if it is associated with one of these nine gifts in, in second, uh, 1 Corinthians 12 or is it something else? Is it about his ordination? Is it about a boldness? Is it about something that, that Timothy needed? But the reality that Paul is addressing is Timothy is not utilizing it. So Paul has heard reports about Timothy that lead him to believe Timothy is not fully operating in what Paul knows he has and what Timothy knows he has. Now, one of the things, and this is, this is a little side point, but I've just found it fascinating because it relates to something that I love, is that this word charisma, when, does any, okay, let me step back a little bit. In uh, about 100, 200 years before Jesus, the, there was a group of 70 Jewish scholars who translated the, the Hebrew Bible into Greek. 
This is called the Septuagint because there were 70 Hebrew scholars who did this translation. This is actually very useful for us because when we try to look at in the Greek New Testament and what is trying to get the Hebraic understanding of those words, we can see that these Hebrew scholars translated this Hebrew word into this Greek word. Are you with me? This Greek word, charisma, when we look at the Hebrew, it's my favorite word. It's the hased. This gift is connected to the covenantal love of God. So this gift that we're talking about here, this charisma that, that Timothy has, Paul is also pulling onto him and drawing him into this came because of the love of God. This is a gift that flows out of your relationship and your love with God. And the love, the steadfast love, the love that's where God says, and you will be my people and I will be your God. Blessed be the Lord, for he has wondrously shown his steadfast love to me. So, there's another point I want to make too. Is like in the case of Timothy, we talk a lot about you know it, it, we're we're focusing on one gift, but I just want you to be aware you probably have more. There's nothing in the Bible that says you get one. You've got your little. It's not it's not a dinner where you get one entree and that's the only one you can have. And if you pick the one wrong, wrong you're in trouble. No, that's not the way it works. The Bible says the Spirit gives as He wills. So you don't always get the one you'd like to have. We'll talk about that a little later. But you get, it's highly likely you'll get more than one. So I just want to put that down in case, because I'll talk about gift, gift, gift. But really in your head, don't think, I only get the one, I better get the right one. Okay? All right. And I think the other thing we want to, I'll talk about that later. Sorry. I'm not as organized as I'd like to be. I think I'm getting the same thing everybody else is, and I'm getting a little brain fog. Okay, so what are some reasons that we might not want to use our gifts? Well, this is his first one. You know, hope. Hope has this gift of service, and she's such a pastor, and kindness, and I want that. I would love to have that gift. That's a good gift. That's a gift where everybody just wants to be around you because you're nice to be around and, and they, they know immediately that you're cared, that they, that, you know, they care for you because they're just something that just, that's their gifting. And there are people who have the gift of service. I love that um, because they're just, they're helping people. That's not me. That's not my gift. <laughs> now, Paul had this, lovely church called the Corinthians. And for those of us who have spent any time reading the letters to the Corinthians, you know in about, oh, I don't know, one verse. These were trouble. Mike every day goes, thank you, Lord, that I have the well and not the Corinthians. <laughs> they were a problem church. And one of the problems they had that Paul actually had to deal with was they were going, prophecy, that's the good gift. And if you don't prophesy, you're not, you didn't get a good gift. You're not as, they actually were creating, in effect, a hierarchy and a division in the church based on who had the good gifts and who had the less good. Oh, you only got word of wisdom. <laughs> word of knowledge, that's the one you want. Right? And sometimes we do that. I mean, we go, oh, that, that word, that prophecy, I want that. Helps, not quite so much. <laughs> but Paul, who says, for the body does not consist of one member, but many. But as it is, God has arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. 
On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow greater honorable. For our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty. Basically, Paul is saying, God chose the gifts you have. God is kind of smarter than all of us put together. God is not in the, one thing we know about God, God does not dishonor us. God is not giving us gifts to dishonor us. God is giving us gifts to build up, that B word again, the body. And we should not be dishonoring each other because I have something different. We are not here to compete and compare. So I might not use my gift of teaching because I'd rather have my gift of being an apostle, and that's sexier. <laughs> not you, your gift. <laughs> or the gift of prophecy, because, oh, you know, those prophets... But that, that's not what it's saying. So we need to stop comparing our gift with other people's gifts because that's not what it's about. 1 Corinthians 7.17 says, Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. We use the expression, swim your lane. Have you ever, I'll tell you what, I was, you know, I'll, I occasionally spend some time on Facebook and I saw this little video and it was the corgi race. There was this little race of corgis at the end of a football game and they had little, little Santas on the corgis and they had them run, I think maybe 20 yards. And it was, it was great to watch, it was funny, but they were running down and there was this one dog, he was winning. Is that, that dog was going to cross the finish line first. And then at the very end, he saw something. He saw a squirrel, and he went, and he ran parallel to the finish line for about 10 yards. And I think he came in, you know, near dead last. Swim your lane. If, he'd run, if you run straight, if everybody runs straight, we all get to the finish line the way we want to. And oh, by the way, you don't have to, can you imagine a swim meet with everybody trying to swim in the same lane, it'd be chaos. We, have the, we, we are so special and so unique. And God loves us exactly the way we are. And he only wants our best. And we are not here to say, gosh, I wish I was like. I wish I had. We are busy with the cares of this world. I love, I love Mark 4 and that parable of the sowers. It convicts me every time. The cares of this world. I mean, it's just, it's just what happens. I mean, God, God knows that this, you know, there are things that are busy. We, we are busy. We get distracted. I'm, I'm a big, big squirrel girl. It's like, choo. there are all these things set up to keep me from doing God's best for me. So it's, it's, it's looking at our lives and being intentional about our lives. I'm not to say that you shouldn't work. I'm not to say that you shouldn't have fun. I'm, this is not to say that you shouldn't do these things, but be intentional. There is only one absolutely limited resource in our life, and that is our time. So be intentional about the choices you make. And I would suggest make one of those being about how you can develop your gift. Another reason is we've been hurt or rejected for using it. So when I first started trying to move in, in praying, praying, praying for physical healing, um, I would go to the Kroger and I would rock up to people and I'd say, you know, can I pray for you? And I would pray for them. And sometimes they would get healed. 
Most, sadly, most of the time they didn't. Um, but, you know, there was those times where people just said, nah, nah, I'm not interested. They rubbed you off, brushed you off. Well, maybe your gift isn't, isn't about that. Maybe it's, your gift is something else. But you've, gone, you've stepped out, you've used it, and people have dismissed you for using it, or they've hurt you because you've used it. I mean, we, let's, re, let's recall, we live in a world that doesn't like Christians. That when we are actually busy doing kingdom business, don't expect the waters of the Red Sea to open in front of you. Expect a little resistance. Another reason, we are embarrassed. You know, we live in such a performance culture. It's like, I don't, again, it, parts of it compare, is comparison, parts of it just, you know, so, oh Lord, I, can't, I don't want to use this because, you know, I'm not that good at it. I pray for the sick and you know, only like one out of 20 gets healed. Do I really, you know, don't know if I want to do that. Oh, you want me to teach? You want me to get up on a platform? I could say something silly. I could trip over my words. I could misread my slides. I could be embarrassed. I, I don't want to do that, Lord. Do you know that the fear of public speaking is the number one fear? I don't have it. <laughs> I'm afraid of snakes, but not... <laughs> But, and, and I actually think this last one, this fear of embarrassment, this timidity, I think this is Timothy's issue. So if we go to the next slide. Because Paul, you know, Paul was Timothy's spiritual father. Paul had traveled with Timothy. You know, you spend a lot of time walking up and down a dusty road. If you spend hours and hours and hours walking along with somebody, you get to know them. So Paul is, therefore, do not be ashamed of the but it's not just do not be ashamed of your skills. What he says is do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. We are not given these gifts so we feel good about ourselves. We are given these gifts to spread the kingdom. We are given these gifts because we believe that Jesus Christ died, was buried, resurrected, ascended to the right hand of heaven, and because of that, everybody has the right to be set free, but there are people out there that don't know, and we need to get the message to them. Because this is serious. This is real life or death stuff that we're dealing with. So don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed about, about your testimony about God. Don't be, be ashamed about me, Paul. Paul was, in the ancient world, they valued status. They valued power. Paul was beaten. Paul was a prisoner. Paul had to work his own way as a minister, as a tent maker. He was bivocational. Paul was constantly defending himself because he was not, I have lost the mic. Can you still hear me? Okay. It sounds, okay. So one of the things is that we just need to remember when we demonstrate our gift, we are giving witness to God. It's back. And here's the cool thing, though, about in God's economy that gifts, as I said, they're both for us and for others. And here's the really cool thing about God's economy is that the gifts he give us, gives us aren't like the gifts the world gives. You know, if I get a box of chocolate and I give it away, I have less chocolate. We would agree with this, right? If I have a gift of prophecy and I give it away, I've encouraged the other person, I've built the other person up, and I've built myself up and actually practiced my gift so I can release it again and again and again. The gifts of God 
Do not diminish in the giving. The gifts of God grow in the giving. 1 Corinthians 12, 7. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. These gifts are a manifestation of Holy Spirit. They are a way that God can, he is empowering us to represent him to a world that desperately needs him. And when we release them for the common good. Next slide. Next slide. All right. So how can we fan into flame? I've got four. I'm sure you can probably think of a few other ones. Oh, practice. Hmm, that seems obvious. If I, no, no, I've met people who have an amazing skill or talent or call it gift for music. Do you think if they never practiced their instrument, they would be as good as they could be if they practiced their instrument? So the the best musicians in the world still practice. They start from a higher platform, but they still practice. They still study their craft. They are still learning. So no matter, even though you give a God-given gift, you got to go out and use it. If you have a gift of healing, what do you think I'm about to say? Pray for healing. If you, if you feel you have a gift of prophecy, what, do you, what should you be doing? Prophesying. Practice, practice, practice. Romans 12, 6. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given us. So first of all, we all get a different suite. It's gifts, but they differ according to the grace that's given us. But this, this is the part we often skip over. Let us Use them. When we're all moving in the gifts that God has given us, the whole is actually bigger than the sum of the parts. The truth be told, we need this, you know, we talk, we hear a lot about diversity in today's culture. And I've I value diversity because the different perspectives, the different environments, the different upbringings that people bring to the party, it makes all of us richer. How much more so the gifts that God has given us to make us richer. Number two, understand your identity. Who are we? Thank you, James. It's important to actually understand this. And, and yep, know it here, know it here, know it, know it in your toes. Your toes need to know that they are attached to a son or daughter of God. And that being a son or a daughter is different than being a servant. So first of all, this is going to help reduce comparison, getting that down. It's going to help create a desire to expand the kingdom, because... It's, it's my daddy's kingdom. It's not my kingdom. I'm, I'm out expanding it. But I'll also say, you know, this, this morning, one of the songs we talked about, authority. Guess what? If I know whose I am and who I am, do I understand the authority I have? By knowing we are a son or daughter, we now can move through that gift because we understand the authority that rests behind it. That I'm not, you know, the truth be told, when I lay on hands and, and pray for healing, I am doing it not out of my authority. I am doing it out of his, the authority that he's given me. Everything points to him. It is for his glory. It is for his kingdom. Now, this is, this is probably the most practical one. Study those. You know, if, if you want to prophesy, you know, Sometimes this does take work. Again, if we use the analogy of, of people who, you know, have a musical gift, they will go and they will listen to good musicians. They will study scores. They will, they study. 
So if you are, if, if you feel you have a gift in prophecy, watch prophets. If you, if you feel you have a gift in teaching, watch how teachers pull together their, their material. Study people who do it well, especially the ones who are, seem to be stewarding their gifting. And finally, my last way to fan into flame, spend time with God. Hmm. Moses' prayer. Remember that, that when Moses was talking to God, he said, show me your ways, God. Show me your ways. And it is in those hours and hours and hours that Moses spent with God that he learned his ways. The more time you spend with God, the more time you can sense how he, he's moving in a room. So like this morning when Mike felt the oppression, that is because he has spent hours with God, and he understands when there is that spiritual burden oppressing. Other people might have just said, hmm, musicians are a little off key today. They're not. But I mean, you might have picked a natural example without recognizing that there was something spiritual. Um, one of the, uh, the people who I actually study um, is a guy named Randy Clark, and he'll talk about um, when he's trying to uh, be in a room and understand, he actually looks for, again, w- look how the Holy Spirit is moving. Understand his ways. Because then you can follow him in this, this wonderful dance. And, and I would also say that as we, we spend more time with him, we get to know him. And the truth be told, then our, our use of the gift stops being about using the gift. And it becomes more and more about giving him glory. The gift becomes about the giver, not the gift. And it is just God, um, let me find the way. Acts 4.13, and this is um, Peter and John, they had, you know, it was after Pentecost, and they had gone out the next, they had gone out and to the gate beautiful, and they had healed the lame man, and then they were taken before the, the council in Jerusalem, and these guys are saying, don't talk, don't, don't talk. But in verse 13, we see the response. Now when they, and this is the, the council, saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. So it wasn't because they had spent 20 years and were the number one Jewish scholar in the land and had 50 degrees, and it wasn't because they were extraordinary and these strange men. They were uneducated and common men. They were as average as all of us. And they were astonished because of what they were hearing. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. The first time I, I, you know, I've read that verse for years, but there was this one moment I read it, and it was probably three or four years ago, and it's just hit me like a woomph. Spending time with Jesus, we become what we behold. And the more we spend time with Jesus, the more we understand the ways of God, the more we can represent him well, And ultimately, Jesus did have all the gifts. Jesus gave the giver who gives the gifts. So I think Jesus had all the gifts. And it is we spend time with Jesus and we become more like Jesus, our ability to move in whatever suite of gifts he's given us becomes stronger. And we now are moving in these gifts, not because 
I want to be God's man or woman of power for the hour, but I want God to be glorified. I want the name of Jesus to be lifted high. So I believe, so next slide, we all, we all have been given gifts. And some of us are on that journey of learning how to steward those gifts well. Some of us have gifts that we don't even realize we have. As I said, some of those gifts you don't have access to. But I'm going to end with a story. And it's a parable of Jesus, and we've heard it many times. It's the parable of the talents. So there was this master, and he had three servants. And he gave one servant five talents, and one servant two talents, and one servant one. And he went away. And when he came back, he went to the first one. He said, hey, I gave you five. What'd you do? The guy said, I doubled it. And he went to the second one. Who doubled it? And those first two, the response is the same. The response of the master was the same to the first two. He said, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. This third servant, I was afraid. You gave me one. I was afraid, so I buried it. Now, this isn't said to be condemning. But we are called to be faithful stewards of what God has deposited in us. Don't bury your gifts. Don't let fear cause you to bury what God's given you. It is hard. That's why we're in community. That's why we have each other. If you're struggling Get, get your posse around you. Get your friends around you. Talk to Mike. Talk to Hope. They're really good. <laughs> but, you know, use them. There are people dying. There are people who are, you know, there are people who are burdened with their church hurts and their, their pain. And they need, they need that person who has the gifts of encouragement. You know, it isn't always the, the fun gifts. Sometimes it's that person who just can sit with you with a cup of coffee when you're hurting. And if that's your gift, use it. Don't say, oh, they're too busy. Oh, they don't want to talk to me. There are, right now, we know there are people who just need a friend. Sometimes that's the gift there is an impact we need to make. There is love we have to share. There are gifts we have to develop. So I'm just going to end with this. And instead of teach out of it, just end with it as a benediction. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. That was really rich. Let's stand on our feet. And <clears throat> get our ministry team to come up. I know in this room there are so many gifts. You as a person are, are gifted. But I know God has put those deposits inside of us. And that's one of the real primary callings of the well is to bring those things back to the forefront in the body of Christ. Not just sticking people in positions, but for us to understand, for us to learn what God's put in us and flow in that area. It, it's not hard for me to flow in my gifting because it, cause I realize it's who I am. And one of the greatest freedoms is I don't have to be like this other person. So it's the ability to go, I'm not that, and I don't have to be that. So I learn what God's put in me, and I get to be me, and it's easy to be me. It's easy for you to be you. But sometimes you devalue yourself because you think others see the world around you like you do, but you see it through your gifts. So it's common to you, but when you realize others don't see 
the world the same way you do because they have a different gift set, then you realize you're unique. And that's the moment you start to flow in who you've become, who God is calling you to be. So I want to pray, I'm going to just pray generally and release this. And then you come and let these guys and ladies pray for you, that you'll step into that, that you won't withhold what God's put in you out of fear. But you're, you're, you're saying this moment, I'm going to step into this. I'm going to steward this. I mean, it's the beginning of the year. If your gift is healing, set this year and study that one thing. Know it inside and out. Be around people that are doing that. Invest in that. You're not going to pick all of them and study them all because then you'll get bogged down in everything. Pick that one. Set it aside. Lord, this quarter or this half a year or whatever it is, make that, that commitment that you're going to step into that. So I'm going to pray over you. I'm going to dismiss you. Um, then I'll meet the, those in the foundations class back in the room here in just a moment. If you are curious about the well, if you want to learn more about the well, we're doing this foundations class. It's the first, second, and third Sunday of each month. So we'll be doing it again in February. It's where you'll come in. We're just going to chat. We're just going to talk about who we are. We're going to try to answer questions and then introduce you to what's next if you want to be a, a part of the well. There's a sign-up sheet out front on the table. Just put your name on it. If you have questions, see me or Hope. Also be praying this week, uh, Tuesday night, a group of us. It's private, um, invite only, but we're going to be ministering deliverance to a, a room full of people here. We'll have about six teams going, so please be in prayer over that. Those are serious, serious times uh, where we're going to, to battle to set people free. So we need your prayers this week. Watch our Facebook page um, just on, on updates with sometimes with prayer requests out there, but be praying for the body, uh, the whole body for this sickness to be broken, the various sicknesses to be broken. So, Father, I thank you for each person here this morning, those at home on the live feed. God, I ask for grace to be released into their lives. And Lord, I bless the gifts that you've put inside of them, God. God, we stir those up and call those the activation. We know the body needs those things. We need what you've put in your people to come to the forefront. And we know the world needs what we carry. So God, give us grace to step into these things in boldness and in confidence, to lay down fear and embarrassment, to be equipped and trained to step into those. So Father, I bless your people in Jesus' name, God. And we just commission them out, God, to heal the sick and raise the dead and to cast out demons, just to live the life as a son and a daughter in Jesus' name. Let's come on down and receive ministry. You're dismissed. Have a good time, a good day, and we'll see you back Thursday night as we kick off a one-year study in the book of Acts.